Uh, there's homework one on Canvas. I hope uh, it's uh, it's available. Uh, it, it involves you implementing decision trees. Um, it's gonna be. It could take a bit of time because uh, it is. Uh, uh, it, this is the first homework uh, of the class, so there might be issues involving uh, some. You know, just getting used to the process. So I encourage you to start soon. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know we can. Uh, please take advantage of Canvas. Um, there are five of us, six of us monitoring it. Chances are at least one of us will respond and you can answer each other's questions as well. Alternatively, if you have questions, you can come to Office Art. And that's the other announcement about Office Arts. Um, my Office Arts were and are going to be after class on Tuesdays. Uh, we've set things up so that you have someone that you can talk to every day of the week. Um, so this, this this table has the information, but uh, you know you don't need to remember any of this. Uh, it's available on uh, Canvas. It's available on the class website. Uh, so if you have questions, come to Office Arts. Uh, my TAs are all wonderful people, and they like talking to people. So uh, um, if you are there, any questions? Any questions about homework? Uh, have people started homework one? Yeah. Have people finished homework one? Okay, yeah, that would be surprising because we haven't actually fully uh, yeah. gotten into the topic. Perfect. Uh, at the end of today's lecture, you should, I think you'll have all the information you need for questions two and three. Uh, three is only for grad students though. Um, there's a question, yes. Yeah? Yeah, so you can just do that, uh, uh, print it out so that we can, essentially it's like a log of the decisions that your program made. It's going to be a long file, but that's okay. Yeah, We can grab the thing and uh, uh, that will be helpful for grading. Okay, um, without further ado, let's uh, jump into the technical part of the lecture. We're going to start uh, this uh, this unit, this section on learning decision trees today. We're still talking about decision trees. In the last lecture, uh, we did see uh, decision trees. There's a question, uh, when will the video for uh, Tuesday's lecture be uploaded? It is uploaded. It is on uh, YouTube. You should have access to it. So uh, we're talking about decision trees. And um, in the last lecture, we looked at what decision trees are. And uh, we didn't uh, really get into any details about the algorithmic questions and such things. Just a brief reminder what decision trees are. Decision trees are a data structure, really, where every node represents some sort of a question about an example. Typically, it's about a feature. and uh, different options take you down to different nodes and you get further questions till eventually you get down to a leaf node and the leaf node is a label. And so given a new example, you start off with the root of the tree, you answer all the questions as you go along and the leaf that you end up with gives you the label. So that's the, the general mechanics of a decision tree. Prediction is kind of easy. Um, uh, it's literally answering a set of questions. What we are, what we haven't talked about is about learning. And that's the focus of today's lecture. My hope is we get done with the learning algorithm today. And if time permits, we'll spend some time on some extensions. Otherwise, we'll pick that up on Tuesday. So uh, the, we will be looking at a particular greedy heuristic called ID3. Uh, this is like a simple learning, simple compared to the other simple learning algorithm uh, that grows trees from the root down, I guess. And um, there are other learning algorithms for uh, decision trees, and they generally have a similar flavor. Um, I like to also kind of introduce different uh, learning algorithms and such things from a historical perspective, because it's not like this thing just popped out of thin air. Decision trees have been around for a while. Um, formally, the way we recognize it today, it showed up in, uh, um, in concept learning and in, in psychology in the 60s. And uh, the ID3 algorithm that we'll look at today was uh, invented by 
Quinlan uh, in the mid 70s and it was uh, it, it was situated in the context of uh, what were then called expert systems expert systems are these sort of rule based programs for building ai um, in the mid 80s there was work by leo bryman and uh, colleagues where they where they developed this framework called car CART stands for classification and regression trees. Uh, there's this entire book uh, called CART. If you're interested, I think that came out in 1984. Um, 80, the 80s also saw many, many different um, uh, improvements on this basic scheme, um, which addressed questions like, what do you do with the uh, noise in data? What do you do with uh, features that are not real, that are not discrete? What, how do you handle missing features? So imagine that you have an example where a certain feature value is unknown. How do you handle that? Um, and you know there were many. There, there was a lot of activity around decision trees in the eighties. Um, Quinlan introduced uh, an algorithm called C four point five and then C five in the nineties. And these are in some sense the default decision tree learning algorithms that are in packages like uh, Scikit-Learn. Um, see, the, these algorithms are essentially improvements on top of the basic ID three that we look at. Uh, if you, you know, if you paid attention to the dates uh, that I mentioned, all of these were, all the years started with 19. So it almost seems like this is just old stuff. Why do we even care? It turns out that decision trees are a very uh, uh, useful sort of a um, hypothesis based. If you care about interpretable predictors, if you care about predictors where there is a, uh, the decision can be traced back to specific choices that are made about the example. And it may be the most uh, the, the sort of natural uh, uh, prediction mechanism or uh, in uh, or a classifier <clears throat> for this particular need, namely the interpretability. In addition, there's, there was also work in early 2000s, which showed that if you want a good um, sort of general purpose learning mechanism that uh, uh, that applies, that is uh, good in many, many scenarios if you don't know anything about the domain. The thing to do, according to the work from Rich Karwana and colleagues in uh, mid-2000s, was you don't train one tree. You take multiple random partitions of the data, train thousands of trees, and have them all vote on the answer. And it turns out this committee of decision trees, which is called uh, ensembling, uh, they, they, there are specific algorithms like boosting and bagging, which are instances of ensembles, tends to be excellent. Um, until the modern sort of revival of neural networks that we are currently in, uh, starting about 2015 or so, an ensemble of decision trees was considered to be the best thing that you could do. If you know nothing about the domain, you just have someone gives you a data set and says, get me the best possible classifier you can you train an ensemble of trees and it's going to be really, really good. Uh, lately, that uh, the, the current sort of uh, trend is to use neural networks, but this served that purpose before. All right, but this is just a historical perspective. It, there's nothing technical here. It's just to kind of set the stage for what comes next. Rather than just presenting an example, I'm going to use, uh, rather than presenting the algorithm directly, um, I'm going to use uh, a running example that we will have uh, for the entirety of this lecture to uh, show you how the algorithm works. So the, the running example, this comes from, uh, I think this was probably from Quinlan's uh, uh, paper. Uh, it's definitely in Tom Mitchell's textbook. It involves the question of deciding whether I should play tennis today or not. Uh, of course, looking outside the weather, of course, the answer is no. Uh, but uh, let's say that we are going to use a decision tree to help us make that decision. And to make that decision, we're going to have four types of features. One of them is the outlook, uh, the weather, uh, how, how's the weather going to be? Is it sunny? Is it overcast? Or is it rain? The other one is temperature, which can take three values, hot, mild, or cool. Humidity can take three values, and the wind can take three values. And the label is a plus or a minus, or a yes or a no. It's a binary classification task. And uh, we are operating in the supervised setting for machine learning. So the first thing to do is to, uh, having decided these things, the, the features and the labels, we are going to decide, uh, we're going to go and collect some data. So let's say we have this data. We observed what we do on 14 days. 
So for the way to read this is, uh, let's just use this row here. It says, if the outlook is sunny and the temperature is hot and, uh, okay, everything I do moves the slide forward. That's not a good thing. Maybe I'll not touch the thing. So if the temp, if the humidity is uh, high and the wind is uh, strong, the label is minus, which means on a day that has that those features on that day number two, I did not play tennis. And so we have fourteen such examples. Uh, we're going to use uh, uh, use this this particular data set to work through the decision tree learning algorithm that we bring. This algorithm is a batch algorithm. What that means is it takes the entire data set and processes it, processes the data as a whole. It doesn't go one example at a time. And this algorithm is recursive. It builds the tree from the top down. Here's an example of a tree that uh, had you run ID3 on this data, you'll get this. And it recursively builds the tree from the top down. What that means is at any point, you just have to answer one question. What attribute, which feature should the data be split on right now? Given all these examples, given these 16 examples, oh, given these 16 examples, which feature should the data be split on? And I'm using the word attribute here because in some of this decision tree uh, literature, that was the terminology that, that was used. And having um, decided to split the data on uh, 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 the, the outlook feature, Whoa. Okay, it's just jumping to random slides. That's not a, a good sign at all. Okay. Oh, I know what's going on. My keyboard. Let's do this. Um, so uh, having decided to split that, uh, you know, having decided that the root of the tree is outlook, the next question is, this feature can take three values. It can be sunny, overcast, or rain, which means you get three edges coming out of that node. What should happen for each of those edges? If you answer those two questions, then you go down to, okay, that hypothesis is gone. You go down to this subset of the data and, not a good sign. Give me a second. Let me just try to fix this. Can people on Zoom still see the slides? Okay, I'm going to try to work with this. Uh, can you find out how, why GoodNotes automatically forwards slides, the pages? It kind of automatically just moves to the next page. Uh, I'll try to, uh, we can't do this in parallel. And so, uh, anyway, this is the recursive algorithm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once you decide what node goes on top, what feature goes on um, on top, and you decide that this feature, you know that this feature has these three possible values, you are essentially partitioning the data into subsets. So the uh, if outlook is sunny, you get a subset of the examples where the outlook was sunny. If the outlook is overcast, you get a subset of examples where the outlook is overcast. If, the, if for the uh, case where the outlook is rain, consider only the subset of examples where the outlook has the value rain. For each of these subsets, now you need to construct a subtree. Well, how do you construct a subtree? We need an algorithm that takes a data set and constructs a tree. Luckily, we have that algorithm. It's called ID3. So we make a recursive call to ID3 and we just go along. I'm going to go through this uh, in a bit more detail and then we'll work through an example. And The basic algorithm, we're going to call that ID3. It has two, uh, uh, it takes two parameters uh, or two inputs, S, which is uh, the set of labeled examples. Uh, in this case, there are 14 uh, entries. And attributes, it's just a set of features that are currently available. So in the beginning, in this data set, we had four features, outlook, rain, uh, no, outlook, uh, humidity, and those other things, wind, and something else. 
temperatures. So we had these four features. And uh, given this, let's uh, work through the algorithm. Now let's consider the easy cases first. Suppose we have a data set where all the examples have the same label. We don't need to do anything, right? We just know the label because imagine all 14 examples had the same label. They were all plus. We don't need to grow a tree to decide that it's a plus. We don't need to look at any feature. We can just return the node plus. We are at a leaf. So this is the base case for the recursion. Um, and what, uh, does this, uh, oh. Did you want to just make a mistake? Okay. No, I can, it automatically moves to the next page and I'm not sure if there's a setting somewhere that I need to change. It's not doing anything right now, so let's not tempt fate. So is the base case clear? If all your examples have the same label, what's the point of actually growing a tree just to decide that this example is a plus, that example is a plus. You just decide that anything is a plus or a minus, whatever that label is. So what if all the examples have the same label, you return a single node that has that label. Otherwise, there are at least two examples that have different labels, right? So now we consider the um, other situation. What we do is we create a root node. This is like, uh, what I mean by that is you just create an empty root node. We need to decide what goes into the root node. So we need the next step is we need to decide what attribute to write inside that root node. Let's say that we somehow choose that attribute A, which is just feature, which is like it could be sunny, it could be outlook or temperature or windy. No, you know what I mean, right? The feature names. Um, we, let's say we decide that attribute feature A, attribute A is the best attribute that uh, classifies the data. And we'll talk about this choice later. Suppose somebody tells us that A is the best thing to split the data on. Then you just put A here. Whoa, whoa. Oh, I know what happened. I spilled water on my iPad. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's not a good thing. Yeah. Does anyone know how to fix a water damaged iPad? Yeah, Buy a new one. Okay. Rice. Rice. Yeah. Rice. Rice. Ah, you're all awake. Like, like when I ask you about decision trees, everyone's quiet and a water damaged iPad. <laughs> Everyone have an answer. <laughs> okay, I will try to uh, just bear with me on this. I will try to get it fixed before the next lecture. I like the. The excitement, it's like a 21st century problem. <laughs> anyway, so we have this. Yes. Uh, why do we feel like Good question. So, what if we choose any feature? Um, for now, let's pretend that we don't care about the word best and we'll come back to your question. But somehow we know that A is the feature. And in the scenario that you described, A is randomly selected. In the scenario that I'm describing, I have a certain choice for uh, picking A. And right after I go through this, uh, the sketch of the algorithm, we'll have a discussion on are certain features better to split the data than others. Uh, there is actually an interesting uh, choice there. In fact, the entirety of the ID3 algorithm revolves around that class. So th that's a good question. We'll come back to that. But for now, let's say that somehow we know that we're going to split the data on feature A. So we're going to split the data on feature A. And let's say the feature A can take many possible values. Um, let, for every value, we create one edge going out of that node. Let's say that we are currently on value B. So in that case, outlook could be overcast. V is overcast. When that happens, um, we create a tree branch for that particular uh, value. And we, now imagine that we have this full data set where every row corresponds to one instance and every row has a value of the feature outlook. We've decided to split on outlook. And one of those values is V. So we can 
filter the data so that only those examples where Outlook is, has that value is uh, remain. Uh, let's call that S sub B. S sub B is the subset of examples where the feature A has the value B. Okay, so now we have a subset of examples. What can happen now? Um, I'm going to attempt fate and try to draw something here. So we have, a, we have this feature A. Oh, no. Unfortunately, I think I can't use my pencil today. I'm going to try to uh, focus on Zoom. Uh, I think some of my devices might be water damaged. So I'm unable to use my pencil. No, it has to be paired. So, um, oh, wow. So I, I'm basically furiously waving my hands at the screen. Uh, I, uh, and hopefully what I'm saying comes through. All right. So let's say that we have the subset of examples S, uh, SV, where the feature A takes the value V. Now let's consider this never happens, which means the, there were no examples in our data set where the feature A has the value V. The subset V, SV is empty. What do you do then? Can you say that? So, no. so but, but we are, we need, think about it this way. We have uh, decided that we are going to create a node with root A. And that choice is done because, you know, we are already a few steps down in the code. That, that, that decision has already been made. We can't go back and fix it. Uh, let's say we can't. And we are now partitioning the data into subsets. Eventually, the decision tree will be used for making predictions. So a new example will come in. On that new example, we'll ask, what value does feature A take? And let's say that we check for value B. We need to make, we need to do something on that new example. What would you do if SV was empty? Any ideas? An assumption. Okay, so you, that's a good, that's a reasonable thing to do. You hit the end, you hit the leaf node. But what what label do you put on that leaf node? Because there is no evidence for any label there. Yes. You can the the current node is a is an interior node. Interior nodes don't have labels. Yes. If you find the leaves that uh, come from the like other branches of A, and if you that thing something. You could essentially something like that. Um, the first answer that came up is you make an assumption. That's essentially the answer. You make an assumption. The assumption that I'm suggesting here is you add a leaf node with the most common label in the entirety of S here. And the reason this is a good choice is because this is we have no evidence in our data. We have never seen an example in this set S where the feature A has the value B. But in the future, we might see that example. And when we do, we need to predict a label. And the best thing we can do, the least wrong thing we can do, is to pick the most common label. Yes. We're not necessarily talking about this. We're talking about some here S. Oh wow, it's been it has a mind of its own. Uh, in this case, S refers to the date, the input to ID3, the, the the data set that's currently available. Uh, the the parameter that's uh, passed is there. So the the this is a reasonable thing to do because this is what can gives us generalization. Uh, it, it allows us to make the predictions about examples that were never seen during the training time, about types of examples that were never seen during training time. And you have to make an assumption and the a not so terrible thing to do is to follow the majority. Imagine there are a thousand examples in S, 999 of them are plus. There's only one minus. And somehow we are inside this situation where SV is empty. Maybe the best thing to do is just assign plus. 99.9% .9 of the examples were plus. The new example that comes in might also be plus. So in some sense, it's the 
uh, least strong thing to do. Okay, so that's another sort of a base case that we have taken care of. Now we are left with the other case. SV is not empty. So let's consider where we are. SV is not empty, and we ha uh, we have not yet this. Uh, we have not yet hit a leaf node, so we need to continue growing the tree. So we need some way, some algorithm that can create a tree using a set of examples SV and a set of features attributes uh, that we have minus a because a is already taken used is taken care uh, has been uh, is used up so we need an algorithm that can take a data set and produce a tree luckily we have one such algorithm id3 so we make a recursive call here in the circle thing so we make a recursive call because we just create a tree using the set of examples that we currently have and uh, uh, the current set of examples is SV and we keep recursively growing down the tree. And this is the entirety of the algorithm. Uh, in, a, in a certain manner of speaking, this is a simple algorithm. And uh, I like to think that algorithms, the complexity of algorithms is, uh, you know, there's a whole notion of computational complexity of algorithms, but there is a certain version of it, which is about whether the algorithm can fit on one slide. And in the previous slide, that this algorithm fits on one slide. And it's an easy enough algorithm that you know you just consider all the cases. Um, I'm going to stop here uh, and pause for questions. Uh, just one. When it's empty, so essentially we are assuming the least wrong. Yes. Yes. It's according to the evidence that we currently have. But there could be other assumptions also. Oh, but we are hoping for the least. No, I'm, I'm, we are hoping that if we add the most common value in the the most common label in the data set, okay. other examples that in the future that may come in are unlikely to are more likely to be the most common label than the other. The other. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what happens if uh, in the future examples that we tested there is a uh, that is uh, ah, that's a good question. So that's that's an excellent question. What happens if in the future a certain feature takes a value that we never encounter? There are a few uh, ways to answer that, and one of those is let's assume, let's hope that that never happens. By that, you need to your attributes should have close uh, values that are from a closed set. So it should uh, your if if my uh, outlook can be rainy or sunny or overcast, you will never see snowy. Which means that you know upfront what values features can take, which is why you are able to uh, answer this question if SV is empty. So you, that's one answer, which is uh, you know you decide upfront what values your features can take, and those are the only values you have. Uh, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is you construct the values that uh, your features can take from the data, which means that in the future, your feature may take a value that is not seen, in which case you need to have an extra no, extra edge coming out of the root node that says other, and you need to have a label there. You can add a, you know, you, if, our, if your feature outlook takes three values, sunny, overcast, and rainy, you add a fourth edge saying anything else. Anything else is treated as if it's a value. And then you'll go into this part here. It's a value that is never seen. So you have a leaf node with the most uh, common label. And that takes care of any future problems. Uh, you are discarding A from the attribute. Yes. That means uh, we cannot remove an attribute. Excellent point. Excellent uh, observation. Uh, at the bottom in the circle thing, uh, in the recursive call, I say mm -hmm. I make a call to ID3 with parameters SV and attributes minus A. And the question is, that means I cannot reuse A because I'm only iterating, I'm only finding the best attribute among the ones that are available. So how do you handle that? I would argue that doesn't matter. Can you, can you or anyone? Yes. S, uh, S, 
um, all the values in SV will have the same value. For That's right. <laughs> because you're subsetting uh, S into SV by the value of A, every example in SV is going to have the same value of A, which means that particular feature is no longer useful because all examples have the same value, which means you can't use that feature to distinguish between the two the different labels. So that feature is essentially going to be useless. There's no point in having it. So that means the uh, identity will be at most uh, the number of Yes, that's right. At most the number of features plus one if you want to add one more for the label. That's right. Good questions. Other questions? Yes. This algorithm does not yet account for any noise. Um, on the other hand, can you say more about that? Um, why, what might noise do? Right, so that particular kind of noise, this one does not handle. Yeah. So the, the question was, uh, this algorithm does not handle the case where two examples are identical with respect to all their features, but have different labels. This cannot, I mean, if you, if you are not convinced, you know, you can think about it offline. This particular algorithm assumes that doesn't uh, happen. If that does happen in your data, then you need to make some assumptions about how to handle that situation. And for example, one of those assumptions could be you uh, treat it as one of those labels. Another assumption could be you treat it as you can consider that as two examples, and eventually, when the whole uh, the, the 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 entirety of this algorithm is uh, centered around the word best, how do we best choose thing? In the calculations, there you make some choices, and uh, we'll talk about that later. Other questions? Any questions on Zoom? <laughs> Today's Zoom experience is a little bit subpar because uh, I'm afraid of touching my screen. Um, so another reason to come to class. <clears throat> okay. So now let's go to the question that came up a little while earlier. How do you pick that feature that goes into the root node? How do you pick the root node? The goal here, or the uh, claim that a lot of decision tree uh, learning research makes is that shorter trees are better. The goal is to find the smallest possible tree that explains the data set. And uh, this is a uh, this this is almost like a philosophical point here. If we have smaller trees, then they are more likely to generalize better. Now you might ask me why? Why should a smaller tree generalize better? Actually, let me ask you that. Why might a smaller tree generalize better? Yes. You're using a word overfitting that we haven't formally seen, but that is essentially the answer. Let me give you, let me illustrate that answer with an example. Imagine that uh, I have a data set with 1000 examples and I have a decision tree that gets perfect accuracy on those 1,000 examples because there's a feature that says, uh, uh, let's say the, the, the data set is about playing tennis. There's a feature that says, what's the weather in Salt Lake City? There's another feature that says, what's the weather in Chicago? Another one is, what's the weather in uh, uh, London? You're, of course, all of this is subject to the fact that we live in Salt Lake City. The weather in Chicago doesn't really make any difference about whether I'm playing tennis or not. But because we have a thousand examples, maybe you choose that feature, you split on that. And maybe you choose another feature, you split on that. You keep growing bigger and bigger trees and you'll end up spitting on all the noise in the data. So you'll end up explaining the noise in the data because the noise might be accidentally statistically aligned with some feature. So the long, the bigger you allow your trees to grow, the more opportunity you're allowing for that to happen. So the idea here is that if we have smaller trees, I'll get you in a minute. If we have smaller trees, there's a less, there's lesser likelihood that 
the smaller tree is uh, just an accidental explanation of the data. I'm thinking of the decision tree as an explanation of the data. Let me explain, uh, let me illustrate this in a different, uh, uh, I'll get to you in a minute. Uh, let me illustrate this in a slightly different way. Imagine that you have a uh, hundred million examples and somehow I have an algorithm that takes all those examples and constructs a tree with just depth one. Meaning there's one node. If you test that feature, if it's on, let's say that it's a binary feature, if it's true, the, uh, the, the label is plus, if it's false, the label is minus. All the other features are error. How could it be an accident that uh, one feature can explain all the data and it's incorrect? Alternatively, let's say I have another tree which is 100 uh, nodes deep and it also gets a perfect uh, accuracy on the training data. What's more likely to happen is that the 100 node tree, 100 node deep tree is explaining the data by by latching on to statistical accidents rather than actually latching on to the signal. So it is a, uh, it, it is more likely that a smaller tree is a better explanation because it, uh, it, it, it's, it's less likely for that to be a, just an accident. It's more likely for the bigger tree to accidentally explain the data. At this point, I have not really given you any formal answer for why smaller trees are better. When we talk about, uh, when we come to the uh, section on computational learning theory, I'll give you basically a theorem called, uh, we'll talk about a theorem called Occam's razor, which formalizes that and makes the, the, the math a little bit more rigorous. But at this point, I'm just appealing to intuition. There was a question. Yes. Um, so, for example, we have a attribute with some like, if 100 possible options that all have something maybe to do with the result. Uh -huh. um, in our decision tree, if we want to make it small, we're like, okay, some of these make no sense. We might just split it and choose like five and make a decision tree for each five because that makes, that's the best in our algorithm. Okay. Would that make sense or would it be like, you can't do that. You have to use a No. So eventually, what will happen here is this ID3 algorithm will end up choosing a subset of the features because of the recursive call. It will recursively just keep calling uh, itself and pick a feature at each time. And at some point, it will stop, and the subset of features that get used are the ones that are. At what point does it stop? Like, the, the stopping criteria, there are two uh, exit points here, right? In the stop, if all examples in the set of uh, that are currently available in this call have the same label, you return. Or here, um, it, it stops when you add a leak. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, uh, if you look at the tree um, for this specific parameter, if I choose that if it's raining, there will be no rain. So, my decision tree will be different. Right? If I Possibly. Like, can we come to the example? I'll be working through the example in some detail. <clears throat> right. If I uh, choose that data, it will be overloading it. So I can just remove that attribute from my table. You could, but we don't know upfront which features are irrelevant. If you depends on the question, right? Yes. Absolutely, yes. If you know that a certain feature is irrelevant, it makes perfect sense to remove it. But typically, we don't have that luxury because our the, the concepts that we are trying to learn might be a little bit more complicated, uh, and they may not. They, they, we might not have a very clear reason to not toss out a feature. We might say, oh, maybe there is a reason. Remember that example I talked about uh, the price of Starbucks uh, and it depending, the price of Starbucks in an American stock exchange depends on weather data six months ago in Nigeria. Why? Because of some rain and coffee beans and all that. So we might not naively, we might not trivially toss up, be able to trivially uh, toss out features un unlike the example that I gave where of course it makes no sense to have the weather in Chicago. So, because I have a question by looking at the weather. Because uh, the question was like, uh, if it's ripe or not. So I was thinking that it doesn't matter which uh, type of uh, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, 
I don't want to write my Don't do that. Uh, uh, just work through the argument. Yeah. Ah, yes. Um, yes, you and then you. Can you use uh, to identify like That's actually a, that's an interesting use case. For sure. You could do that and uh, that could get you some gains. The question? If I may just put that one up here for a moment. We've discussed that having a very small distribution of field distribution from that method to the more dark level of this way. Um, we haven't really explained why it's better to still even look at the data. If you just take it back and say small distribution is best, is that more good? Aha. It's not small distribution is best. Among all possible trees that get that get the hundred percent accuracy on the data, smaller trees are better. Yes. How do you use mean tree? How do you use mean tree to react to outliers? It's not that obvious in the area. Uh, we'll talk about that when we uh, wrap up the, the discussion on uh, that part of the extension thing. Uh, they you have to do a little bit of work to deal with noise in the data. Oh, there's a question. <laughs> oh, um, are you sure? Okay. And now we'll know if the water damage is in my iPad or in my computer. And now, what is this? Not even look. Oh, okay. Oh, it spilled on my table. My there's like there is a. Is this a common epidemic? What is it? Oh no! Let's not do this. This is going to be more complicated. While while I'm doing this, uh, are there other questions? Okay. No, if you there's the, the okay, that's a good question. This algorithm is entirely deterministic. So if you and I run the same algorithm, we'll make the same choices, except in in a very very specific scenario where it is not going to matter. Um, give me one second and I'll make sure that I'm sharing. Can people see this on Zoom? Can people still see this on Zoom? I think, yes, okay. Um, it will be, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the, the, you, once we decide on, uh, well, once I tell you what the criterion for choosing the best node is, you'll see that it is, there's no randomness there. Okay, so the, the, the let's uh, come back to the point. Imagine I have two trees, one of them, both of them get 100% accuracy on the training data. One tree is really small, one tree is massive. The intuition here is that the smaller tree that perfectly explains the data is better than the larger tree that, uh, that perfectly explains the data because it is it cannot be an accident that a small explanation is also the right one. So it must be the right one. It cannot be just a statistical accident. Unfortunately, Finding the smallest tree that perfectly explains the data by enumerating all possible trees is actually a computationally intractable problem. Technically, it's NP hard, which means we can't really uh, solve that problem. Instead, the ID3 algorithm, which also builds a tree, is a greedy heuristic where the choice of the best attribute is designed so that it favors smaller trees. Uh, the main decision, of course, is what feature do you split on? And to illustrate the, the this particular case, let's consider this data set. Let's say that you have two features, A and B. Both of them are uh, Boolean, so it can be 0, 1. And let's say we have a data set where the, uh, the example A equals 0 and B equals 0 with a label minus is repeated 50 times. And A equals 1 and B equals 1 is repeated 100 times and so on. So you get you have 200 examples here in total. And the question, of course, is which feature should we select to split the data on? Should you select A or B? Because we have only two features, let's just enumerate all of them. Let's consider both cases. So if I split on A, 
you get a no. If I fit on A, when A equals 0, the label is minus, and when A equals 1, the label is a plus. So at the bottom of, when I partition the data on A here and here and here, should not do this. When I partition the data on uh, on the feature A to be zero, when A equals zero, I get a subset of the data where all examples have label minus. So I'm calling this a purely labeled uh, node. And when I partition the data on, okay, and when I split on B, uh, when I when I part, uh, when I go to A equals one, I get another data, a subset of the data, which is also purely labeled. So essentially, in both sub, in both cases, we end up with the uh, base case of the algorithm. On the other hand, if we split on B, when B equals zero, uh, we get a set. We basically that corresponds to the first row only because those are the fifty examples. All the examples there have a label minus. But when B equals one, we still haven't removed any ambiguity because there are fifty examples with um, when b equals one, there are 50 examples with a label minus and 100 examples with label plus. We need to split once more. So we need to split once more when we need to uh, then look at the feature A. Now, the question is, do you prefer splitting on A or do you prefer splitting on B? Hey. Why? <laughs> That's because I said so, but why is A better? And Small, uh, uh, the, 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 smaller, but perfectly explains the data. Smaller, but perfectly explains the data. Yes. So why is it better? It's less computationally expensive, but think about it this way. Imagine that feature B in this data set was actually irrelevant. <laughs> the real concept was only dependent on A. Suppose the feature B was actually mm -hmm. irrelevant. By actually spreading on B, we are doing extra work and we are actually getting a larger field and we might end up uh, fitting, we are allowing the opportunity to fit on noise. Possible. If A is the only relevant feature, we are done. How do you know that A is the only relevant feature? How, how instead of 200 examples, imagine that you had 200 million examples. You had 200 million examples but if you split on A, you get label plus, and if you split on B, you get label minus. So you have a ridiculous amount of evidence that splitting on A equals, when A equals one, the label is plus. There is none of the other features matter. Intuitively, <laughs> you might you might agree that you found the true uh, the true cost. There are hundred million examples with label plus. There are hundred million examples with label minus, and the feature A perfectly explains all of it. Instead of two hundred, if you feel like two hundred is small, let's go to two hundred million or any big number that you want. On the other hand, if you if I tell you that, yeah, you know, first you check B and then you check A, you might argue that, but why are you checking on B? The feature B, I, I'm already giving you a perfect explanation for the label. Why bother even looking at those other features? So in this case, it's, it's almost an intuitive argument. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm only making an intuitive argument here, not anything more than that, uh, that uh, splitting on A is better. But, Let's make things a little bit more complicated. What if we had three examples in this uh, where A equals one and B equals zero? Now, which feature should you choose? Let's, yes. Are we still going with the 2000 or the 200? Like, it doesn't really matter. Let's say 200, let's say 2000. If you feel like uh, uh, in 50, 50 and 100 are small, let's make it 50 million, 50 million, just three and 100 million. One answer is you should probably pick B. That's another answer. And what would the what would you pick? <laughs> okay, so we have two possible uh, options. Either you split on A or you split on B. The good news is if you, in, in either case, we can draw the full tree. So if you split on B, you get this tree. You can just take my word for it that this get this perfectly assigns the right label for all the 203 examples or whatever number I said, and three examples. And if you split on A, you get this three. They look structurally the same. There is no computational difference between them. 
Having seen this, which one would you pick? Uh, I've heard your voice. I've heard you. I've heard you. Someone who's not answered before. Yes. You may think me because we're more likely to get to a lead node on the break decision. This is only this is only three examples where a leads one and two. Uh huh. Oh no, maybe I'm not. But but my thought is there there's one of the trees where the first split is going to be more likely to classify a data something like that. Let's put the numbers there so that it can help. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to reconsider your answer? Yeah, split on A still. Split on A still. And can you explain the answer? Because uh, looking at our training data, 100 of our examples are going to be classified on our first decision, but only 53 will be classified. Right. That's, that's a, to me, that seems like a reasonable answer. But does anyone have someone something else to say? At this point, anyone, maybe you also, and I and people. Just, uh, that on the first try, I will just check like which decision picks out my examples checking, and for the last note, even I have to check one fifty on one level, but it is one zero three on one level. Right. There is an uh, yes. Inside the binary search, you want uh, both sets to be valid, so it's. The quickest way to reach your decision. The quickest way to, and so based on that, would you prefer A or B? A. A. This is about the downside. Okay. Uh, someone said B. I forgot who. Did you say B? Okay. Do you want to say A? Oh, okay. If you are going to say B, can you justify B? Well, every decision has to be balanced by one of the variables. So on A, if you go to it's um, B0, it's only three there, okay? But if you were to do one more starting or starting with B, it's more balanced. Why is being balanced a good thing? Because you want one more diversity. Well, no, this is, uh, this is after learning. This is the result of the learner. The learning algorithm produces these two options. Could you argue it's more? More what? Could you argue that it's more, it has more learning integrity? Um, I don't know what that means. I guess it's better, more accurate than the learning data. They are both perfectly accurate on the training data. And the training data is all you have. That's the point. The training data is all you have. And we are hoping to make choices that's going to impact future decisions. So let's think of it in a slightly different way. Which of these trees might be, um, well, both these uh, trees are going to make the same decisions for now. But uh, I'm not going to go down that path because that's just opening a door. Uh, did you say B? Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone said B and they... Because B means the first one. B is the one of the... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I find probably will find one reason is that the that one, like the only three, but that thing could be noisy big. And? And so that... You know, recently the predictions were noise. But the same noise is here also. Mm, but this uh, comparing like uh, each label, the, the, the difference between the, link, the the number of labels is also as big as that one. So this one will be a So that's the, so the, the, the one of the reasons for picking B might be it creates these balanced looking trees. Mm. And maybe there's a reason to create balance here. And the reason for picking A might be, it quickly eliminates ambiguity. And it very quickly takes us to a decision. And the bottom of the tree where you have those three things, maybe that's noise, and maybe I can just tune it out. And I'll get a right label. Uh, I'll go to you first and then you, yeah. Uh, well, actually, I've been thinking about it more. I don't know if I have an answer or three. Or okay. Yes. Yes. So, what do you think is my answer to the conclusion in this context? Uh, among the 203 examples, half the examples you quickly assign, you immediately assign the label after one check. 100 examples get a label when A equals 0. And among the remaining examples, you check, and you know, the, 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 well, at that point, you don't have a choice. But 
you quickly, with very few decisions, in this case, with only one decision, you are able to assign the label for almost half the exam. And if the number 150 and those things look small to you, replace them with 100 million and 50 million. There is overwhelming evidence in this case that when A equals zero, the label is minus. There is no need to check B at all. You don't even need to open up that feature. I would argue there is an advantage for A. There's an advantage for A because even though these two, two trees have the same height, most of the examples <coughs> sit higher up in the tree uh, that splits with A. Because most of the examples, you get the label higher up. So it's structurally the same tree. These two trees are structurally the same, but uh, half the examples get taken out with fewer uh, higher up in the tree. So it's smaller in that sense. It's fewer decisions for most examples, for more examples. The ID3 algorithm tries to quantify this. Um, the main decision here is deciding which feature to pick when you're splitting the data. And uh, the, the intuition for the ID3 algorithm is we would like to pick split examples. Uh, in, we would like to find feature that partitions the data into relatively pure uh, subsets. Into, in, in the first case, one K, uh, the, the partitioning on A gave you 100 examples that are all plus 100 examples that are all minus, perfectly pure. In the second case, 100 examples are all minus. Almost all of them are plus. There were three that were outliers. The ID3 algorithm favors those kinds of partitions. And it uses a heuristic uh, called information gain that was introduced by Quinlan. Information gain is built on the notion of entropy. How many people have encountered the concept of entropy before? Uh, in outside of physics, in the context of, uh, okay, a surprisingly small number, but that's great because that means that uh, the next bit is not useless. For those of you who've seen it, this is a reminder. For those of you who've not seen it, this is an introduction to entropy. Entropy is a measure of the impurity or the amount of disorder that's uh, in the set of examples. And I'm giving you an introduction to this stuff, not from the formal information theoretic point of view, but to the extent that is necessary for this ID3 algorithm. So if we have a set of examples, um, let's say there are P plus of them have a label plus, P minus of them have a label minus. Entropy is a measure of how pure, how impure or how much disorder or how much uncertainty is in that data. So uh, it's defined uh, mathematically, it's defined, uh, it's usually denoted by H. So we have H of the labels of S is P plus, uh, it's the negative of P plus log P plus minus P minus log P minus. It's, a, it's easier to explain what it is than to actually state it. Um, you can generalize this. Uh, if you have K possible values, the of P plus and P minus, let's say you have P1 through PK, I basically take PI log PI, always in this case, the log is the base two, add them all up, negate it, that's the definition of entropy. Entropy uh, has a rich history. Uh, it was introduced uh, by Claude Shannon in the 19, late 40s, early 50s. And uh, this information theory as a field had the same sort of uh, intellectual and public excitement as machine learning does today. To the point where intellect information theory was the standard choice of uh, uh, buzzwords that people used to use. If I need to solve a problem, well, maybe information theory will help. Uh, that was the 1950s. Uh, entropy was part of, is it plays a big role in that. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, when you say positive and negative, is that the presence and the both? No, I'm, I'm not talking about the, the, when I say positive and negative examples, I always mean positively labeled, example label plus, example label minus. When I say it's always with respect to the labels. Yes. Let's uh, let's kind of take this out to a step. If all examples have the same label <coughs> in a set, then let's say they are all plus, then P plus is the fraction of examples with label plus, so it's one. P minus is the fraction of examples with label minus, so it's zero. When I apply this expression, P plus log P plus, so there is one times log one, which is a zero, minus zero log zero, which is, uh, let's just say that it's equal to zero. Uh, it's actually a indeterminate value, but the limit is zero. 
So the entropy there is actually zero. When the label is, all examples have the same label, the entropy is zero. This makes intuitive sense. How much uncertainty is in that data set when all examples have the same label? Absolutely none, because I know that all the examples have that label. There is no uncertainty in the data, so the entropy is zero. On the other extreme, let's say exactly half the examples had label zero, and uh, label plus, and exactly half the examples had a label minus. So the entropy here, and I'm going to actually try writing the math, and let's hope that it works. Is uh, okay. Let's try one more time. My, whoa. Okay, I can't write the math, so I'm going to furiously wave my hands and pretend that I'm writing stuff on the screen. Um, if p plus equals p minus equals half, then if you plug that expression thing in there, you get half times log half to the base two which is a minus one, half time, minus half times minus one is just a half. And both of them are the same, so you get entropy equals one. For binary decisions, the highest you can get, uh, the highest entropy you can get is a one. Let's kind of, uh, uh, you can work this out offline, but let's uh, dive into that a little bit more uh, in detail. Well, 50% of the examples have a label plus and 50% of the examples have a label minus. You cannot get more uncertainty than that, right? Exactly half, give, if I get, given that situation, I give you a new example. You have no idea what the label is and it cannot be more uncertain than that. That is the, that situation corresponds to the maximum entropy possible. When the, the, the uniform distribution has the highest entropy and the distribution where all the examples belong to the same label has the lowest entropy. So that's why the entropy corresponds to uh, uncertain. There's a question. So when you said before that the philosophy of identity you should split on attributes that are relatively pure, mm -hmm. what you meant specifically by that is the attribute that would cause the least of entropy. The least, uh, the attribute that will cause the highest decrease in entropy. We'll talk about that literally next. Okay. Yes. Entropy can be, uh, the, the entropy can be seen as the number of bits that needed to convey information. Um, so uh, the, the example I like to use, uh, this uh, comes from, I think, the textbook on AI by Russell and Norvig, um, or some version of it, it's a paraphrase of that. Imagine that I'm telling you about, I, I need to convey the weather um, uh, to someone. And let's say that the weather, uh, I, uh, today we're talking about, let's say the weather in um, Salt Lake City. Some random day of the year, Salt Lake City can be cold, like it is today, make thought of. And on some other random day, it could be hot. Right? So if I just tell you, what's the weather in Salt Lake City? You don't have any idea what it might be because you, you may not, it could be hot or cold depending on when it is, uh, what, what day of the year it is. So there is some information that needs to be conveyed. On the other hand, let's say I talk about weather in Antarctica. It's hot or it's cold. Well, it's never hot. I don't need to actually convey any information. The number of bits of information I need to con convey to remove the uncertainty about the weather in Antarctica is zero. Entropy is a measure of uncertainty. How much entropy is in that uh, uh, is in the in the weather? Uh, in how much information is necessary to convey the weather in Antarctica? Zero because there is no uncertainty about it. How much information is necessary to convey the weather in Salt Lake City? Not zero, because depending on the day of the year, it could be hot or cold. Entropy is a measure of uh, uh, uncertainty. It's a measure of uh, ambiguity uh, or disorder. Um, so, uh, yes. Sorry. So, in case of Antarctica, as you said, if, if we are certain uh, about, like, let's say, yeah. for some example, so the entropy would be lesser. Lesser, it will be it will be zero for Antarctica. I think and I think Antarctica is cold. Some of you may disagree. Um, so there is no information. There is no need for me to convey that information. So if you look at these three probability distributions here, the way to interpret this uh, is uh, I have two labels, minus and plus, and the length, the height of this uh, the bar is the probability associated with that. The entropy associated with the the leftmost one and the rightmost one 
is lower than the entropy associated with the middle one because in the leftmost one, most of the instances belong to plus. So with high probability, the highest, you know, it, 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 there, there is less uncertainty about what the label is because it's you know, mostly going to be a plus. So the entropy is you know, the blue bar here that represents the entropy. On the rightmost one, the entropy is a little higher than the left. Am I missing out on my left and right here? It's to your right. On the farthest one, the uh, there is more uncertainty because the probability of plus has come down a bit compared to the other extreme, and the probability of minus has gone up a bit. The entropy is higher. The middle one, the probability of plus and the probability of minus are both equal, and the entropy is highest because there is given a new sample from that distribution, you can't tell if it's going to be a plus or a minus. Given a sample from the one on this corner here, if I force you to pick a label, you'll say it's a plus because most of them are going to be plus. So it's, there's less information to be conveyed. This, the same thing applies for multi-class situation classification also. The far corner there, imagine that every bar represents a different label. The one where all the labels are equally likely, but one of them is extremely more likely, has the lowest entropy. And the middle one, where every label is equally likely, has the highest entropy. So the entropy for the middle one can be much higher. This is a, uh, the, uh, this is like a, like a crash course on entropy. I'm not going into too much detail. Uh, high entropy corresponds to high uncertainty. Low entropy is low uncertainty. Any questions about this? Yes. Uh, I don't want to go into that a bit because it's kind of a digression and it's not uh, going to give us take us into uh, more all, along the direction that we want. We can talk about that offline. <laughs> yeah. So, can I imagine uh, if everything's the same, so we can be more uncertain about it? If every what is if, if, it's, if all probabilities are the same, yeah. that corresponds to maximum uncertainty. Okay. If all decisions are the same, that corresponds to least, least uncertainty. Yes. Is entropy is a very good possible entropy value in zero to one for zero? Ah, a very good question. If you have only two choices. Uh, like plus and minus for binary classification, the highest entropy possible is one because that ha happens when the, both of them have an equal probability. If you have more than two choices, the highest entropy possible is the log of the number of choices to the base two. And if you want to kind of prove that to yourself, consider the following sort of a loose argument. The uniform distribution has the highest entropy because that corresponds to maximum ambiguity. So, Given that, the uniform distribution for, say, three labels, each label would have an, uh, a probability of one third. So one third times log one third, three times. That corresponds to log two. And there's a negative there. I always forget the negative. Mm -hmm. There was some other hand that I saw, but I think I lost track. Or folks on Zoom also, there are questions. Yes. You can calculate it, but the answer is both of them will have an entropy one. Yeah. Okay. This is pretty much all you need to know about entropy for the purposes of what comes next. Higher entropy is more uncertainty, lower entropy is less uh, uh, uncertainty. The intuition, and this goes to the question that came up before, the intuition with ID3 is we, among the features that exist, we choose to split on the feature that reduces the entropy the most. By reducing the entropy, you're getting rid of ambiguity. You're getting rid of uncertainty. So you, does that uh, intuition make sense? I see two heads nodding. I'm going to take that as a representative for everyone, unless there are questions. No questions. Okay. Uh, here's the information gain attribute. The information gain 
uh, criterion that was used uh, that was introduced by um, the ID3 algorithm. And if I had access to my pen, I would actually write this out more slowly. So I'm going to just walk you through this by talking. Imagine that you have a filter A, and uh, there is a, a data set S that we have to we 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 have at our disposal. Given the data set, I can calculate what's the entropy of the label on the data set. The entropy of the labels on the data set is a measure of how much uncertainty is there in the label <coughs> for this particular data. For example, if all the examples in the data set have the same label, the entropy will be zero. So the entropy of S represents what is the, uh, the uncertainty in the label for that particular uh, set. Now, let's say we have a certain feature A that we are entertaining. We are trying to assign a score. The information gain says, first you compute the entropy of the full data set. And from that, you take away the average entropy. So let's see if this, this, the highlighted expression here is for every partition of the sub, uh, examples, you compute the entropy. And then you uh, assign a weight for that partition by the size of the uh, you know, S size of stuff. SV divided by size of S is what fraction of examples belong to that partition multiplied by the entropy of that partition. Now, if you just stare at this, this probably makes no sense. It definitely does not make sense because the slide has even moved past. Thank you. So if you just stare at this expression, it probably makes no sense. And I think the only way to kind of work through, uh, uh, get an uh, intuitive feel for this is actually work through an example. So rather than actually talking about uh, this in just symbolic form, let's actually go back to the tennis data, compute the entropy, and see what happens. But after this is done, I would encourage you to go back to that example with the A and B feature, apply this information gain criterion, and see if this information gain is higher for the feature A or feature B. Is it uh, how much uncertainty does the choice remove? That's literally what it is. How much entropy does the choice remove? The left-hand side, the thing before the minus is the entropy of the data. The thing after the minus is the average entropy of each of the splits. So the entropy of the data minus average entropy of the splits is how much entropy still remains. That's really the intuition here. Um, but let's work with the example. We have five minutes and I'm going to try to finish this example. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it's entirely possible that I can go through this example in five minutes because I can't write. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So let's go back to this uh, tennis data. Um, you have a, uh, we have four features and our goal now is to decide which among these four features is the best one. So we have these four features, but before we do anything, the information gain at, uh, says what's the entropy of the full data. And I'm saying entropy of play because that's the label we care about. There are nine examples here that have uh, uh, label plus, and there are five examples that have a label minus. So the, the fraction of examples that are positive is uh, 9 14, and the fraction of examples that are negative is 5 14. So this is what I call P plus and P minus. So you can literally plug this into the de definition of entropy, and you get an entropy of 0 0.94. 0 0.94 is closer to 1. That's because 9 14 and 5 14 are basically closer to half than they are. Uh, not. So there is a fair amount of uncertainty in the label. This is the total uncertainty that we have to work with. Now, let's go through this one feature at a time. Let's start with the feature outlook. That just corresponds to this column here. It doesn't, we don't just look at that column. But anytime I say entropy here, I'm only talking about the entropy of the label. So let's first consider the example where outlook is sunny. This is the subset of examples where the outlook is sunny. When outlook is sunny, we have only these five examples that are still in play. And among these examples, two of them have label plus, okay, row number 11 and row number nine have uh, label plus, then the other three have a label minus, 
and I can compute again what's the entropy of this subset of the data. It's uh, literally the same thing, and we get 0.97. There's quite a bit of entropy uh, uncertainty here. Things have gotten a little worse, but there are other rows. When Outlook is overcast, we are subsetting the data to these four rows: three, seven, twelve, and thirteen. All four of them have label plus. None of them have a label minus. So P plus or P is uh, one and the, the P minus is zero. This data set is, has no uncertainty left. The entropy of this data set is zero. Okay, so now we have another subset, which is rainy and we can do the same process. So we had three subsets of the data, one correspond to each value that the feature takes. And each of them has three different entropies. So we have for the subset where the label is sunny, when the feature is sunny, you get a 0.97. When the feature value takes overcast, you get entropy zero. And the feature value of uh, Outlook also gets a 0.97. You can go back and verify that. Now using, but each of these are, you can't just average them because you, you take the weighted average of these three entropies. So this part here, don't, Oh man, I'm, I need to bag up, buy a bag of rice. So <laughs> the, the first part there corresponds to the value equals sunny. And 5 14th of the example had that much entropy. So you assign, uh, you take the weighted average, you weigh those that entropy by 5 14th. And then 4 14th of those examples had an entropy zero. So you multiply that. And 5 14th of them have 0.97. So you get the weighted average entropy, which is 0.69. We started off with an entropy of 0.94 for the entire data set. Out of that, if we split on Outlook, the average entropy, the expected ent uh, decrease in entropy is uh, uh, 0.24 because the, uh, the expected entropy for the splitting on this is 0.69. This 0.24 is called the information gain if you split on uh, outlook. You do this for each feature. We just split on outlook. Next, I check on, I split on humidity and I go through the same process. When humidity is high, you go, humidity takes only two, val two values. When humidity is high, I get uh, an entropy among the subset of examples. When humidity is normal, I get another entropy. I take the average of that. I get the expected entropy there. I can compute the information gain. This process is at best boring. Uh, because I'm just doing some boring numerical stuff. Good news is you'll be doing this in your homework also. Uh, somehow that was uh, supposed to be a positive. I'm not sure how. In any case, so you apply this information gain criteria, you get uh, information gain for humidity. You can do this for each feature. Outlook has in, uh, information gain of 0.2. Humidity has 0.1. Wind has 0.04. And temperature has 0.02. There's a question. Yeah, is there like a cutoff of what's the We literally just pick the one that has the best, highest information gain. The choice here is you choose to split on the attribute that has the highest information gain, you split on output. I we have a minute, so I'll this is the last thing I'll do. I'll um uh, I'll stop I'll stop here for questions. There's a question, so maybe it's there's a question. Oh, there's one minute. Uh, information game is conception useful, but from a global perspective, it's trying to use analysis to compare the expected. We can't compute the expectation because we don't know future data. No, the expected and expected. Oh, yeah, it is. That's literally what it is. So it is yes, the negative of that. Yes. You will have to calculate this for every feature. And that's why this algorithm is going to be slow. Okay, I'll stop here. Hopefully, Tuesday's class will not involve these technical issues. Um, at this point, you should be able to get through at least the first question of the homework. And maybe you can even get 